Um, uh, I'm Mark Jackson, and uh, I'd like to uh, welcome our special guest, Mark Tarpening. Okay, so I, I, I like telling stories, okay? So you'll have to forgive me, but I, I, I might tell a few today. Um, so uh, from my standpoint, I think for everybody and every business, it's important to know uh, your, your why. You know, why are you here? Why are you existing? What do you, why, you know, why? So uh, here's a story to kind of, that sort of illustrates that, that fact. It's, it's, sometimes it's very critical, very important. Um, my wife, Tammy, was born in Kingsburg, and her family has been in this valley since the early 1900s. So several generations have been here. And uh, her great-grandmother, Kemp, was a fantastic cook. That's what she, everybody knew. She just, everything was wonderful. She, everything, she cooked and it's just, okay, so it was always good, right? Easter, Easter was always, you know, the highlight, right? She would cook the Easter ham, and it was always just wonderful. And, 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 and every year, she would cut the ends off of the ham. And so she was known for, for making these wonderful meals. And the ham was just was tremendous. So that, that tradition and that recipe was handed down, you know, decade after decade. It was, it was handed down generation to generation. Her, 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 her grandmother cut the ends off the ham. Her, her mom, and then Tammy, you know, they, they, were, they, just, they always cut the ends up. And the, and the hams, of course, based on her recipe, they were always great, always fantastic. It always worked. So one year, by chance, maybe not so much by chance, but all four generations, which is very cool, which is something you'll find here in the Valley a lot, were in the kitchen making Easter dinner. And uh, Tammy asked her, her great-grandmother, so well, what, you know, you, this, this always tastes so wonderful. You know, we've always been doing this. All of us have been doing this all these years. What is it about cutting the ends off the ham? I mean, it, they, it always tastes so good. And her, her great grandmother said, "Well, it it wouldn't fit in the pan if I didn't cut the ends off the ham." <laughs> well, so sometimes it's important to know why, right? So, um, so uh, why are we here? Um, well, first off. Uh, the pie shop, okay. The pie shop is, is, is sort of what you guys have seen when you were uh, donating and, and registering for this event, okay. Some of you guys may be familiar with it. I know some of you are. Um, the pie shop's predecessor was, is Blue Dolphin Engineering. Now, I started Blue Dolphin Engineering 20 years ago, right here. And um, we've done work all over the world. We've done work in so many different verticals and different industries, uh, different projects, uh, covering everything from really simple devices, simple consumer products, to very complex machines and mechanisms. Automation, electronics, you name it. We've done, we've done I, I've never turned a job down. And, um, but always, over the 400 some odd customers we've had over the last 20 years, always focused on the thing, okay? It's always been we can design, make, prototype, test, and analyze, and get in production with your thing. But we never helped with the rest of the business. And any of you who are in business or who are entrepreneurs realize that there are so many different parts of being in business. And so a few years ago, I started on this journey to create an incubator here in the valley that was focused on things. So hence the, the pie shop. The pie shop, pie stands for product incubator. And uh, we opened the doors in September and we have some very, very cool members already. A few of them are here today who have some very incredible ideas. Uh, we have uh, a couple companies from Australia that are working on some very cool things and they're here in the valley because their resources and raw materials are perfect for them for for them to develop their businesses, and it's one of the reasons why they're members here at the pie shop. Um, so, so why are you guys here? Well, you're you're here to hear Mark, probably not to hear me so much. But but the reality is is that the reason you're here is 
because of a discussion that BJ first had with Mark and then I had with Mark about what the pie shop is and his belief that this is a worthwhile thing to support. And I think it's important for you guys to all understand my belief and the belief of a lot of people here that we are capable of doing anything here that can be done anywhere else in the rest of the world. And we need to remember that. We need to foster that. And the pie shop, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So uh, uh, that's, that's why the pie shop's here. And, and I'm bound and determined, and people know I'm very, very uh, uh, determined and to, to make sure that, that it's successful and that this happens. So, um, uh, so okay. So a little bit about Mark. <coughs> Mark is, uh, was born in Sacramento in 1964. So he's, he's a Valley native, just North Valley native, but he's a Valley native. Um, he obtained a BS degree in uh, computer science from UC Berkeley in 1985. The Stone Ages. The Stone Ages. <laughs> I also graduated in 1985. Um, uh, in 97, 1997, he, he, he worked for Textron actually at a school uh, and he worked in Saudi Arabia. So he got a very good understanding of, of that world, which is different than ours, and, uh, and the oil industry and, and, and everything related to it. Um, and in 97, Mark and uh, Martin Eberhard founded Nova Media. Uh, they built an early ebook called The Rocket Book. And that led to some good success for them. They, a few years later, they sold that company and, uh, uh, and made a good amount of money, a, a decent amount of money from that. Uh, but that's not where it ended. That's probably why you guys are here. But so in 2003, uh, Mark and Martin teamed up again and they collaborated to, find, uh, to found Tesla Motors which now is Tesla. Um, and uh, so it's been a pretty interesting journey. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a few years older than you. I, I was born in 61. And I'm a Cal Poly engineering grad, OK? Uh, and you're a Berkeley grad. So uh, I know when I was in school, back in the Stone Age, as you were saying, there, there, were, there was no entrepreneurial program, OK? Entrepreneurial, that word, entrepreneur, I don't think I even heard it at the time I was in school, and uh, innovation, and in the engineering department, business, you know, you, nothing related to, you were going to go to work for, you know, Lockheed, or General Dynamics, or, you know, HR Textron, or somebody, you know. Uh, so those words and that kind of idea wasn't part of, 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 of my school, and I'm assuming that, that that's the uh, way it was for you. So, so what was it, what was the, was there a pivotal moment or what was it that switched that caused you to think, I want to, you know, be an entrepreneur, I want to go out on this venture. I mean, what was it that started this whole thing? Oh, I get bored easily. Oh. Yeah, it's just, you know, uh, I, uh, I don't like to do the same job for that long. So uh, it's, you know, an attention span kind of thing, but it, it still it works. So the, uh, when I left Berkeley, uh, I went and worked for Textron. But I did it sort of on contract because I wanted to check out all the different possible jobs. And I discovered that there was this kind of job that you could get, which they would send you all around the world and put you up at super nice hotels. And you get to travel to all these exotic places. And they would pay for it all. And I, as a 21-year-old, I thought, this is perfect. Like, you know, I love this. And I get to play with all this great technology. Uh, but I didn't want to be pinned down to one particular thing for, for that long. So that was, I ended up then coming back to Silicon Valley. Well, when I got tired of that, I ended up in Silicon Valley because like if you're a movie maker, you have to end up in LA. I mean, it just is where you end up if you, if you make movies. If you're you know, a software person that's really into it, you kind of end up in Silicon Valley, at least especially at that time. And once I was there, everybody was in a startup. And that, I got hooked. I could understand that. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm always impressed by uh, disruptive, game-changing innovation. So it's a, like three way overused words, okay, but, but 
I truly am. I love elegant solutions and simple ones to complex problems. Um, so uh, when you got into uh, when you got into uh, Tesla and decided to to do Tesla, um, what was it about Tesla that set it apart from other car makers? Uh, because uh, uh, BYD was in, in business, and, and, then, and then after you got started, Fisker, and there were some other people. But, but obviously, Tesla, at least it seems obvious, that Tesla's been so much more successful than, than these other companies. I mean, what was it that set, set, it, set you guys apart? Well, first off, th we're serious about it. <laughs> so it, it's a f funny thing. So electric cars existed um, in the early 1900s, right? So th in fact, all of our conference rooms at Tesla headquarters, before we moved to the, the big one now, um, were all named after failed electric car companies of the past. <laughs> and, and we actually had, Martin, my you know, co-founder, had gotten the original ads for these car companies uh, and framed, he bought them on eBay and he'd, he would frame them. And these are from the late 1800s, generally, although some were a little bit later. So it was really cool, Baker, the Baker conference room, Baker uh, Electric was a, it was a fabulous, you know, sort of uh, funny early 1900s car. So the idea had been around, obviously, for over 100 years. But at that time in 2003, uh, nobody was making electric cars. The car industry had determined that cars, electric cars didn't work. Batteries were not very good. They were not getting any better. The lead-acid battery in your, your conventional car right now is almost unchanged from the 1950s. Uh, and really is only a little bit better from the early 1900s. The thing is, is that when you look at that explanation, you know, you've never had a lead-acid laptop. You've never had a lead-acid, you know, you know, cell phone. Uh, because consumer electronics and Silicon Valley people don't use lead-acid batteries for anything except their cars. We went to NICADs. Oops. We went to... Okay, is that going to work? Yeah, better. We went from NICADs to nickel and metal hydrides to lithium ion. And our experience in the ebook world with the lithium ion batteries convinced us that every year it gets a little bit better and a little bit cheaper. And that crossover point is what we were looking for, is when was this going to be actually viable? And if you plot that and you, you, know, you look at it, you say, well, actually, we could make a pretty compelling car almost right about now. But by the time we actually get into production, it's going to be you know, better and cheaper. It's going to be, it's going to be a, a better thing. So that disruptive thing, you're always kind of looking at where the new technology that's going to come in, where that crosses over. Uh. Very cool. So Tesla ended up, I mean, I know, um, uh, I know from doing some research on you that, that, that Tesla was, you were trying to find a problem to solve, right? And um, and uh, you did a lot of research to get to get to that point to the point to where you decided to do electric cars, right? I mean, uh, yeah, nobody decides to do electric cars lightly. Like that's just not something that happens. You know? uh, it's a it's a really big lift because it's super hard to do, and you can't. Um, you got to do a lot of planning to make sure that it's really going to be viable and it's going to it's going to work. The biggest problem that, that we confronted, once we looked at the technology and realized that the batteries were going to be, that's the, the key thing, and the batteries are going to be good enough. Not great, they're not where we would, you know, would really ideally like to have them, but they were getting better every year, so by 2005, we sh they should be great. Uh, but it was the difficulty of making the actual car. Uh, you know, Because that's something that we didn't have any great intuition on. The drivetrain is all electronics. It's wires, it's batteries, it's computers. That's like what we do in Silicon Valley. Like that's what electrical engineers do. It's what software people do. Uh, the car thing is kind of a mystery. So we really struggled to figure out how we were going to build the, the actual car part. And along the, you know, these months and months that we spent, or six months, nine months, researching it, we discovered that, that the car industry had changed the way they made cars and that there were suppliers that made all the components. In fact, the only thing that the Fords and the GMs and stuff kept was marketing. And, uh, marketing. They don't have sales. Sales are franchised, right? But the marketing department, uh, the final assembly, and the creation of the, of the motor, of the engine. Well, we didn't care, and that was their crown jewel, was this engine thing, which we didn't care about at all. 
So, and, they didn't, and then they outsourced half the design work, so we could outsource the design work to the same kind of people. The final assembly, it turns out that they outsourced some of the final assembly, so we could do the final assembly with somebody who also was in that ecosystem. And then we would provide the drivetrains. Uh, so that, it took us about nine months to get there, to really understand that it was going to be possible to actually make the car part. We were pretty sure early on that we could make the, the, the electronics. and We could make the car go if we could just have a car. Well, and you had some definite uh, goals. I mean, well, I mean, what were some of the goals of what that car, it wasn't just going to be like a Cushman. It was, I mean, it was... No. Yeah. <laughs> you, you had some... So, no electric cars were being sold in 2003 because they were the cars that were on the market, if you will, were all hand built. They were all meant, uh, they were like glorified golf carts. Some of them only had three wheels. They couldn't even get the fourth wheel on. And, and those are not cars. Like, no one's going to buy one of those things deliberately. So, you've you got to come up with something that's compelling. And one of the things about, uh, I think, as an entrepreneur, is you have a great idea and you, you kind of fall in love with that, but you got to make sure lots of other people fall in love with that product too, or you don't have any sales. It's all about delighting the customer. You know, it, it was, you know, Steve Jobs always said that, and he's right. I mean, you got to have something that delights the customer in, in whatever way. So, what to, to do that with a car? You've got to make an actual real car. It can't be some bizarre thing. And then once you decide you're going to make a real car, then all kinds of what's called FMVSS, the Federal Motor Safety Standards, kick in. And you actually have to make a real car. It has to have airbags and crumple zones and, and, and not kill anybody. So the moment that you make that, that mental leap that you're going to make a real car, you want to make it as compelling as possible. And one of the things that electric cars do better than any other uh, car, internal combustion engine car, is they accelerate. <laughs> they accelerate in a way that is unlike anyone, if you've never been in a, in a performance electric car and stepped on the accelerator, you just don't understand it. Well, you've Mark's never... going to get rides here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We used to do that a lot. Uh, and, there's a, and there's a technical reason for that. So, so electric motors have maximum torque at zero RPM. This is why they don't have clutches and stuff, because at zero RPM, they're at max torque, and they stay at max torque for you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of RPM. And then they eventually drop off at constant horsepower as you saturate. What that means is, is that you're kind of in first gear from zero to 70, you know, or 90 or 100. And if you're in first gear all that way with no interruption of torque from the very beginning, you got max torque. It, it's a, a different experience. So when we looked at that and we realized that we needed some kind of competitive advantage, um, that was something that, that was so much better than an internal combustion engine car. And on top of that, if you look at how cars are sold, it turns out there is a market for that. And that market is at the high end, which we needed because everything's going to be expensive at the beginning. And those are called sports cars. And the faster that you go zero to 60, the more money you can charge for that sports car. Now, why exactly? I don't totally, you know, I never really understood the sports car market, but, but the data is incredibly clear on that. You know, so a McLaren that can do it now in, what is it, two, two seconds or whatever, is a million dollars or 350,000 or something like that. Um, but so when we figured out what the Roadster was going to be capable of, it had to be better than an existing car. And when we delivered it in 2008, that little roadster could go zero to 60 in 3.8 seconds or something, which was, and it was you know, nearly $100,000, yet in that price performance curve, it was kind of cheap. You know, for that kind of performance, it was difficult to get that kind of performance for, for less than 100 grand. So we could come in at, the, at a great market point, we could be, compete with the existing gasoline powered cars, uh, and we could be totally green. I mean, and it's, the thing about electric cars is it's super cheap to operate them. So that's a great thing. Although, if you're buying a $100,000 car, you know, it's never going to pay for itself because <laughs> you'd have to drive a lot to do that. Yeah, very cool. So, uh, another part of the technology, and you mentioned this, the batteries. What, what was this, how did that develop? I mean, like you say, did you just pile a bunch of lead-acid batteries in the bottom of this thing? Yeah, they can't do that. I don't think so, you get that 3.86. No, no. So, so the batteries, that was Martin's, really uh, out-of-the-box thinking. So 
batteries come in a lot of, lithium ion cells get made in a bunch of different ways. They get made in these pouches, they get made in these little cylindrical cells called 18650s, which are like fat AA cells. Uh, and at that time, the only standard form factor was the, the, the 18650s, the fat AA's, which we used in laptops at the time and, and cell phone, or not cell phones, but uh, camcorders, which were like cell phones except they didn't make calls. And, and uh, anything else, it had, it had needed little batteries. And they made them by the billions. So they were, you know, commodity. Lots of different companies made them. You could buy them, you know, uh, in bulk. Only they wouldn't sell them to you, but you could, in theory, buy a sort of separate discovery along the entrepreneurial journey. Uh, so Martin said, well, you know, we always talk about these cell equivalents. Well, what if we just put 7,000 cells in the Roadster of these little double A's? And I thought, well, that's insane. You, you can't, I mean, like, ah. But the more we thought about it, the better it was. So it's difficult to do that. It's difficult mechanically. It's difficult electrically. There's uh, is safety issues. There's a bunch of things going on. But as you engineer around those, you can buy these cells in really large numbers. So we were only making, you know, a couple thousand maybe roadsters a year. But we were a major consumer of these 18650s. You know, we weren't quite at Dell's level, but we, we were pretty darn good. You know, like we got special attention from all the battery companies as a little tiny startup, you know, with 200 people. And normally they would charge a lot for a little tiny startup for 200 people, but we were buying thousands and thousands and thousands of cells. So that put us on the map and allowed us to get our single biggest cost uh, driver to being rock bottom, I and mean, we weren't quite getting Dell pricing, but we were awfully darn close. And that just, you know, we just rode that commodity pricing curve down. So, so that, the battery was the most difficult part. It's where we started. So all of our engineering effort at the beginning had, was all around, can we do this trick with all these 18650s in a way that's manufacturable and safe uh, and, and will last for 100,000 miles? Yeah, very cool. I know uh, John Ellenberger, who's, I believe, is here. I think they're talking about using the 18650, and they, they've created a, a, a business that's trying to light the world, give light to people all over the world. And he's going to be, uh, you know, adapting to use those 18650s in the in this small rechargeable light that's basically for people who everybody who needs light. So neat projects, and and you know, I'm sure that. Tesla's use of them in all sorts of now applications is probably helping that price for him too. It's, I know we were talking about the other day, it's gotten ridiculously cheap. Okay, they've gotten much, much more, uh, much, the price has come down on all the theme on cells. And, and the pouch cells are becoming you know, more price competitive. And actually the 18650s are sort of a, a bigger, fatter version that's, that's you know, slightly different dimensions. So um, uh, I know, uh, you know, as you developed, you did your research to, to start this company, um, you covered a lot of different aspects. I mean, you, you, you sounds like you looked at, looked at every thing that most starting business would look at. You tended to make a go at this. And I, I believe it ended up, uh, you ended up uh, creating an actual business plan. Yeah. Which is kind of... Unheard of now. Unheard of. Yeah, Passe now. Yeah, uh, Silicon Valley, nobody does a business plan. Nobody does. They yeah. do slide decks, right? So, I mean, yeah. I we did slide. those too. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> we were so, really I mean, good with slide decks. So, you know, what is your, I mean, as an entrepreneur now and, and as somebody who is in this world, you know, what's your feeling about the, the business plan? I know I, I tell people who we deal with and our customers for either the Pie Shop or Blue Dolphin, you know, and any plan that you start, whether it's a business plan or any plan, as soon as you start to implement it, it it's, it's not right. It goes away. So, uh, but what's nice about a business plan is it, is it forces you to look at all the different aspects of what you're doing. And sometimes if you actually looked at everything, you may not even start, which would, might be a horrible thing. But uh, so a business plan is a, is a, is a good device. So I, I just kind of want to know what your thinking is of, business plan versus none. And yeah, I mean, you certainly have to have a model, a financial model, a business model that's going to work. There is a danger that if you actually really pencil it all out, 
you'll get intimidated and, and, and not do it. It's like, it's like having kids, right? If you actually knew, you know, like in advance everything, you're like, you'd never do that. Nobody would do that. Um, so it's, you know, you have to be a little careful about going too much detail, and partially because the detail will be wrong. Like the, the moment that you start, you know, you learn stuff and it changes. Um, that said, you really got to figure out kind of how you're going to make the product, how you're going to distribute it, how you're going to service it, how you're going to, you know, get people to buy it, you know, get the word out, you know, like all of those things you really have to have an answer for. And, you know, my picture of Silicon Valley, right, so I, I am used to, you know, being in those pitches and the VCs are always going to ask about those. Like, so you got to have an answer. You can't hand wave and, and not know. Now, the answer that you have when you actually go to do it, you know, a year later or two years later, might have morphed quite a bit because you've learned a whole bunch. But you got to have a pretty, you know, a good stake at it. I mean, it's something that makes sense and you think that this is a path through that, that we think will work. It may be along the way you find much better paths through, but at least you have a, a zero order solution that you know is going to work, or at least you hope that it will. Yeah, well, I, I agree. There's going to be, it's, it's, it's a good place to look and helps you answer questions. Okay, so uh, I, I another story here. I told you I like stories. I, I have a friend who teaches, uh, he teaches uh, in the physics, I think. He's still teaching uh, physics in, at Buchanan High School. And he's been doing this now for many, many years. Um, uh, and I remember him telling me this story that the computer club at the school was in the, the parade with Buchanan High. And they were marching, and they, and they just going down the street. And they had a little banner in front of them, though. It said, uh, you know, because he's basically, years ago, basically the geeks and, you know, nerds or whatever, everyone. And it, it, this banner said, you know, laugh at us now, you'll work for us later. <laughs> so um, uh, if, if you, if you, the, the computer science major, and by the way, I don't know if this was this way at Berkeley, but at Cal Poly, you could tell computer science majors from 100 yards away because they were the guys who had to carry the punch cards in their pockets. We, we didn't have cards. those, not punch cards. <laughs> See, so, so advanced learning at Berkeley. But um, uh, in any case, if you uh, today, if you had to go back to you in high school and had to give advice that would help you now as this entrepreneur, what, what would that be? So there's been a big change. In, so I, I'm also, uh, for the last nine years, although I just, I just didn't run for re-election this last uh, cycle in November, I've been on the school board, our local school board, for the last nine years. And so I got kind of sucked into the whole education thing. One of the things that education now is much better at is this idea of kind of reflection and being very intentional about your learning. And that's both, you know, for the, st it's, it's student driven really. I mean, you want to get the students to do this. So one of the things that I would tell my younger self is to actually figure out what you want from these classes and take those classes and get that from them, as opposed to working on classes that worked into my schedule so I could do other stuff. I mean, like, that was not ideal for a lot of things. Uh, but, but to also be very intentional about what, what you're learning and keep iterating on that. You know, it's just a, it, the, the, this sort of hacking your own learning is, is, is really powerful and, and is, is much, it's like the norm now. Uh, so, you know, studying is not a bad thing. Like studying actually improves your performance, which is a shock if you're not used to that. You know, like, oh, and it's a little bit like if you practice piano, you actually are better at it the next day. It's like, I remember that revelation in my 30s when I had it. Uh, so that is something I would tell my younger self. There's a lot of, uh, you know, both at the university level, but the high school level too. My, my kids are involved, or my middle one is in high school right now. And uh, that school is really focused on a lot of interdisciplinary thinking uh, and some very interesting sort of synergies between, you know, the, the history class and the Spanish class and, and the physics class, for example. And you kind of think, how is that, you know, but, but they do stuff like that all the time or the chemistry class. And I think that that's all, you know, part of that trying to get not just rote, 
you know, learning, because that just doesn't work. And, and especially now, because there's a, a great statistic that, and I, I'm gonna mangle it a little bit, but that something, like the kinder, people going to kindergarten now, it's gonna be like 65% of the jobs that they're gonna start, when they get started at school 20, in, at age 22, or to start in the job market at age 22, 65% of the jobs that they're gonna be going into don't exist. Like, there's, I mean, the, the, those categories and those types of jobs, you know, aren't, we don't know what they're gonna be because they're not here yet. And you think about that, and you think, oh, well, that's just some, you know, futurists thinking all these great things. But if you look back on the, the people who are five, who are now 22, it's just over half of those jobs when they started kindergarten didn't exist. So if, you're, if the school system is set up in a way to train for the current jobs, it, that is going to lose because by the time they actually graduate college, you know, chances are less than half those jobs are even going to be available. So, and those are going to be the dying industries anyway. You want to be in the growth ones. So it makes perfect sense to me. Interesting. I know, uh, uh, I know they're doing a lot of project-based learning here, learning how to solve problems, which serves you the rest of your life. Uh, uh, I don't know if all of you know, but here in Fresno is uh, Patinu High School. Patinu High School is the first in the country entrepreneurial high school. Uh, and now there are other ones that are cropping up uh, based on this model. But it's pretty cool that they, Fresno Unified, decided to do this. But then a year, they came up with this concept and actually established this high school. And uh, they've been doing some kind of neat things there. So, uh, current, uh, current development right here. Um, so, okay, we, we were talking about before we started today, and uh, this sort of, I had a question uh, that's related to, to something we, we had talked about. Um, there's often an emphasis, uh, and you describe it as venture-based businesses as opposed to bottom line-based businesses, uh, you know, where people are focusing on burn rate versus focusing on having a positive bottom line, and the way they progress is different. And uh, hear your thoughts. Yeah, that isn't exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, everyone's heard of venture capitalists, right? I mean, and it's the, the lifeblood of Silicon Valley uh, is, is all these VCs that pump billions of dollars a year or a quarter, really, into Silicon Valley. So those those companies, the only companies that they can um, invest in are what's called venture scale companies. And what that means is, is that company uh, has to have an exit. So the company you know, can grow and become profitable and be fabulous, and that's what all, you want all companies to do, but they have to have a path to an exit, to, 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 to sell. So, one of those things would be an IPO, which recently there's a whole slew of IPOs coming up. And that's enormously powerful in Silicon Valley because those investors that put that money into those companies, they will get that money back out. And that's the way the VC model works. It's not greed or anything. It's just that's how the money comes in. It's got to come back out again. So those are venture scale companies. Uh, they just have to have an exit. That exit might be an acquisition, and acquisition is totally fine. Uh, and ideally, the company is profitable. Ideally, it's got an enormously awesome bottom line. I mean, Facebook, whether you love it or hate it, I mean, they print money, which is not a bad thing for a business. You know, if you're printing money, it's a good thing, you know, in general. It just depends on if you're actually physically printing it. But, that, uh, but uh, they don't invest in that kind of stuff. But so. The, the VCs invest in that kind of stuff. But that, that is, in those businesses, everyone knows about. Everyone hears about them. They're the, they're the Teslas and the Facebooks and the Googles and uh, the Amazons. But that's a tiny part of the total economy. There's lots and lots and lots of businesses. Most businesses are not venture scale. You know, I went to a great little smoothie shop in, in downtown on my way here, uh, and they have like three locations. And they're a totally fine business. They probably do fine. They had lots of customers. They, you know, were successful. But there's no exit. There's not, you know, the, the, that cannot take venture money unless they're going to expand into every municipality in the, in the country. So there's, most of the economy isn't venture scale. So when you take, and when you take venture money, 
what you're saying is, I have convinced the VCs that I'm venture scale and I had better scale like crazy and, and become that. It doesn't mean that you have to, to you know, be billions and billions of dollars on your, your revenue line, but uh, you want to dominate some niche that has value and that somebody's willing to, to acquire you for or perhaps go public, depending. Uh, and that's just, it's, it's very different. So we, you know, I get to see lots of people with ideas and, and many of them say, oh, you know, I, and I want to raise money, you know, and I'm like, well, it isn't, that, that, that particular business is a great business. You're going to probably, it sounds really good. I don't know that world very well, but it sounds like it's going to work, but uh, there's no exit. So it, it, is, it can't take venture money. Right, right. So good point. I think sometimes people get uh, caught up in that world because it gets a lot of notoriety, and they believe that everybody, I mean, a lot of people think we're all going to talk to all have billion dollar ideas, and I'm not going to ask the public market and things like that. But I, uh, I, it's a good point that if you're going to get into that world and you just use investment money, the investors are looking for you know, good returns, and um, you really have to have a model that's going to uh, supply them. Uh, and and it, 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 it's not even just good returns, it's that the money has to come back. Has to come back. Right, so, so you could imagine, you know, you invest in a business that does well and, you know, cranks along at, you know, 10% a year, you know, growth and, 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 you know, you could even have dividends, I guess. But the, if, if the money can't come back, if they can't sell their stake to get the money back in, you know, into the hands of their investors, um, it doesn't work. Because uh, that money's trapped. It's, it's, it's gone. So it's a matter of scale, right? Because if you watch Shark Tank, Shark Tank is a lot smaller, it's more contained. Yeah. Is that along the same lines? Yeah, I, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, like my wife is a physician and, and she never has watched either Grey's Anatomy or ER, okay? <laughs> uh, so I, I've, I've heard of Shark Tank and I've seen the promos for it. Um, that's not a normal VC operation. I'm just, I'm just saying that. Uh, but, but, and the company doesn't have to be giant, giant. There are lots of, of, of you know, VC fundable companies that, that grow you know, from a small number to like a $300 million valuation and get acquired. That, uh, VCs like that. That's a totally reasonable path, right? Uh, that doesn't have to be worth you know, $20 billion on the stock market. Uh, but the thing is, is that it can't just stay in business without being acquired or going public because the VCs need that money back. The, the, their investors, those pension funds and CalPERS and CalSTRS, they need to have that cash come back. It's the way that the model works. Well, and uh, one point to make is that uh, these VC investments, uh, they don't have to be public. Most of their investments are going to fail. And so the reason they are looking for some of the larger returns too, I think, is because uh, often, some often what they invest in doesn't make them. So they're taking very high risk, uh, knowing full well that they may not be able to do it. So when they do, it's nice when they do. Yeah, it's just kind of appropriate. Um, going back to the foundation of your company, at what point did you go from being a guy with a great idea to being a guy with a great company? I mean, what was, was there a, was there like a pivotal event or some specific thing or even a small list of things that, that per, permitted that to happen? Because I always say, you know, everybody's got a great idea, but almost none of them will ever make any money out of it. Right, so, so most people who have great ideas actually never execute on them, right? So most people take themselves out of the game right away. That's... You know, it, that's just the fact. 90% never actually decide, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend all of my time working on this idea and trying to, to get it out there. Uh, you know, we had done this before, so we, we kind of knew how to, how to do, make that happen. Once you raise money, once you raise venture money, you know, you're on this sort of, of, of ride that you have to keep delivering and you have to keep be getting bigger and you have to keep making these deliverables. So there is this moment where you, when that check clears, basically, and the money's in the bank, 
you know, you take a deep breath and go, okay, we are really, really off to the races. You know, like this is, we're committed like in a, in a really profound way. Uh, on top of that, there is this funny moment, and I remember it at, at both of the companies that we started, where uh, like at, at Nuva Media, I remember I came in, uh, I had some meeting or something, probably out trying to raise the next round of money, uh, and I came into the office late, you know, like 10, 11 in the morning, because I'd been, you know, doing other stuff, and I walked in the office, and it was filled with people, and all those people were clicking and clacking away on computers and on the phone and doing stuff, and I thought, oh my God, this is, this is just like a real company, you know? And then I thought, oh, it is a real company. Like, this is so crazy. Look at what we've done. It actually is real. So, and it, it, I remember that same moment at, at Tesla when we reached this difference between, you know, Martin and I sitting in a little office trying to think about what to do to, uh, you know, walking into, you know, uh, with lots of people running around doing stuff that I had no idea what they were doing. I just assumed they were doing the right thing. At least I hoped, you know. Uh, but they were clearly doing something. And that was, that was really exciting. So that was a moment when it was really happening, that it was a real company. Even if you know, it was hemorrhaging money at the time, but at least you know, we, were, we were working towards a product that was gonna make money. Yeah, that's how we got the money. Yeah, we raised, uh, we raised uh, total probably about 50 million to get the, maybe about 70 by the time the car was actually out. Yeah, the, the Roadster, you know, and then, then there was more raises to do the sedan, and then eventually, uh, and I, you know, I left right about then, and then uh, eventually, of course, it went public, so. Oh, yeah. Oh, so the question was, is there any challenges raising money? You know, like, um, money is super, super hard to raise. Uh, I have met people that, that are in these you know super hot startups uh in fact jeff bezos one time he, he told me a story where he said it was so there were so many people after amazon trying to invest in amazon he he thought about programming his phone to say you know if you're a venture capitalist press one you know <laughs> if you need if you need to invest now you know press two or you know whatever uh, i've never been involved in a company like that Right. It's always been a total slog to, to, to raise money. And so almost every pitch you do, they say no. Uh, we were turned down by so many VCs. There was one point, so at, you know, when you're in this process and you, you know, you've raised money and you're you know, at these, these various you know, events uh, and you'll meet a VC, and if they're not from a firm that you know, it was always kind of, a, at that time, it was always kind of a surprise and it'd be like, Somehow we didn't pitch you, because you know, like we pitched everybody, you know, and, and, and almost everybody said no. But you only need a few to say yes. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the first round, the, when the lead investor was Elon Musk. That's how he, that, that's, so he, we had money from Compass Technology Partners, which is a small firm in Silicon Valley, uh, and another one called SDL Ventures, which is also a very small firm, and then you know, some scattered angels, and then Elon was in the first round. And that's how we met, met Elon. And I, I think, you know, I've said this before in other forums, but the great point, when you go and you're pitching a VC with a really crazy idea, something like electric cars, like that's pretty crazy, electric sports cars. At the time, it sounded insane. When you're doing that, the VCs, you know, look at you kind of crazy and they're like, this is a crazy idea. I'm not sure, we, I'm not sure it fits our theme and, you know, all this other stuff, right? Um, when we pitched Elon, he had just started SpaceX the year before, and he's down in LA, and he's building rocket ships, right? So we're in his factory, or his, his facility there, and they're designing these giant rocket motors, because you start with the motor, right? And he's got these enormous, you know, the bell thing of the thing, they have this giant prototype that's, you know, huge. Um, and you're pitching him about this, this electric car, and he's like, oh, yeah, this is a no-brainer, I get it, you know, fine. And I thought, it's so great to be pitching somebody who's like doing something insane, like utterly insane. Because <laughs> um, in comparison, your electric car thing seems, you know, pretty pedestrian, it's not a, not a problem. Yeah. Um, back in my undergrad, I wrote a paper about Tesla, and I'm just wondering, oh, I'm just wondering, now from, you know, back in the days of the Model S to now, what would you say about, you know, how it's grown 
your success through all that? Well, you know, so I, I am not at Tesla now, and I wasn't, so, we, it, so I didn't, I didn't run the, the Model S arc. We, we had started on that a couple of years, you know, before, uh, and, uh, and we were just switching over to like all hands on deck to do the S when I, when I left. Uh, I mean, it's been amazing. Elon's been, you know, fantastic. Well, you know, he, when he became CEO in 2008, he really did, um, late 2008, he really did uh, accelerate the company in a way that's, that's hard to believe. Now, we got lucky in a couple ways, weirdly. I mean, the financial crisis really benefited Tesla because we ended up with Numi, the, the factory in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, and that was a, a total stroke of luck and timing that, you know, you couldn't predict. Uh, it was much better than the plans that we were putting in place um, before that. But it's, I think it's been an amazing trajectory. It's, it's obviously not without its bumps along the road, you know, and, and Elon's been very good at, at pushing the company forward. He's not, you know, necessarily, you know, perfect operationally, obviously, but, you know, there's a lot of, lot of well-known issues. But on the other hand, the company has has grown in an amazing way, I think. Any other questions? We got a mic over here, so back there. Facing Thanks. Thanks for coming to Fresno and uh, supporting the pie shop. Uh, where do you see the future of transportation? Where do I see the future of transportation? Well, I mean, that's a really big question right now. Yeah. Uh, so first off, it's going to be electric. Uh, electric wins on every front that you can imagine. It is much, much simpler. Uh, there's no maintenance cost. The, it's, it's much cheaper to drive you know, per, per mile or per kilometer because the energy is, is used so much more efficiently. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's much, much more efficient. I mean, like it's like a factor of five more efficient. So it's going to win in the long term. It also has you know, no tailpipe emissions and, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, and obviously, depending on where the power comes from, it can be extremely low carbon. Uh, in fact, even, even in the Mexican California, you know, it's, it's much lower carbon than any other way of, of, of driving. So it's going to be electric. Whatever, whatever it is, it's going to be electric. The world is going to go electric. Whether it's going to be autonomous driving, whether it's going to be you know, that people just effectively, you know, summon their Uber-like autonomous pod. You know, I don't really know. I'm sure that that's going to be good in some places. So downtown San Francisco, you get off the train, there's no viable public transit from the end of the train line. The idea of summoning, you know, an autonomous pod to take me that next, you know, couple of miles, I think is really compelling. You know, living in the suburbs, am I going to just not have a car and do that? Uh, that doesn't, I'm not so sure about that. How about trucks? Oh, the, the trucks will be electric. Uh, it, so when you say trucks, trucks is a really big category, and we study this a lot. So there are light pickup trucks, which sell lots and lots and lots of, and those are used in a, in a bunch of different ways. So the light pickup trucks that are used for a lot of companies the fleets, they'll go electric because the maintenance costs are less, the operation costs are a lot less, uh, and they don't, they go in kind of defined places. You know, the, the, the guy who runs the electrician shop here in, you know, Fresno, he knows, you know, he's going to be driving around in the next few hundred mile range or whatever is fine because any given day he doesn't drive more than a few hundred miles in that day. Long haul trucking is a different thing, and I don't really know where that's going to go. I mean, ultimately, it'll probably be electric, but, you know, that's a long, this, things go for a long way. Uh, and then the, the big, you know, sort of, uh, oh, and delivery vans will all go electric because there's, again, it's, it's just a, you know, price performance thing. You know, DHL and everybody and, and, and UPS are all looking at, at going electric in a big, I mean, they're spending a lot of, lot of money trying to go electric because the economics is so compelling for them. And they're getting so squeezed by you know Amazon and the and all the e-commerce stuff. So all of that's going to go electric. The, the and you know Ford just invested 500 million yesterday in uh, Rivian, uh, you know because their electric F-150 isn't doing very well. So they invested 500 million dollars in a company that's going to compete with them making 
F-150s, you know, uh, or the equivalent, which I thought was interesting, because uh, you'd think they would know how to screw the car together, but anyway. Uh, but so even they're, they, they're thinking that it's gonna, even, even the pickup trucks will go electric. There's a culture aspect that's gonna take a while to get, get over. But you know, on the other hand, electric trucks have unbelievable torque. Like just, you know, towing, not a problem. Towing fast, not a problem. Yeah, is the world supply of lithium going to constrain anything? Not lithium. No, there's lots and lots of lithium. And, and lithium is, uh, it's a salt, it's kind of everywhere, it's in the ocean as well. In fact, where you, where you harvest it is in ancient seas that have come, you know, that, that have, have dried out over and over and over again, and they've left a deposit of, of lithium salt. So lithium is not, uh, and it's recyclable as well. It doesn't, it doesn't get consumed by the battery. You know, it, it just, it, you just have to, to reprocess it. So lithium isn't going to be a, a constraint, at least not in the, you know, sort of long term. Uh, there's a bunch of, of, of fancy metals that get mixed in. Cobalt is the, the most obvious one. Cobalt is quite small. It's very expensive and quite limited. And, and unfortunately, it tends to come from really unstable places. Uh, the Congo is one of the places that a lot of the cobalt comes from. That, I think, is a much, more, uh, a, a much bigger problem. They're using ever less cobalt per kilowatt hour in the cells, though. And you can actually make them without cobalt. They just don't store as much energy. And for EVs, you kind of need the, the bigger, they're called energy cells. You kind of need that chemistry that provides a little bit more energy. So I mean, cobalt could be limiting. I mean, we're nowhere close to that at the moment where that's a, a problem. And again, that isn't consumed, it's completely recyclable. In fact, it's a little bit like the aluminum can thing in that the cobalt, lithium is not super valuable, but cobalt is. So it makes the recycling of lithium ion batteries much more economical if you have cobalt in them, <laughs> weirdly. You mentioned earlier uh, doing research doing a lot of homework to try to determine whether this is viable. Yeah. What form did that research take? Were you doing surveys? Yeah, what kind of research were we doing? Focus group surveys? No, no, we don't believe in that. Uh, so there was a lot of research that we did just on markets. So the nice thing is that people did buy cars. There was a, there, there's a, 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 an existence proof that cars are valuable and that people want to buy cars. Um, so we had a lot of data on that, and we just looked at to see, you know, what markets we could play in, where we could sell, you know, what price points existed. Uh, in terms of actually doing, uh, you know, actually uh, focus groups, where we found, and this is both with the electronic book, you know, the, as a consumer product and the, and the car, we used it to find individual things uh, about our design. So for the electronic book, this is, you know, before iPads, I mean, it sounds ridiculous now, but in the 90s, these were really hard to do. The display technology didn't exist. Our biggest problem in the 90s about the electronic book was get, getting money was that no one believed anyone would ever read on a screen, on a flat panel screen. That was the most, no one's ever gonna read something on a screen. Like that's, that, you know, that was the way, even the VCs, like, ugh, no one's ever gonna read on that. So uh, what we would do is we would hand the prototypes to, to people and in a focus group and just have them play with it and see what they thought. And like one of the first things, we had this beautiful swoopy doopy design and we hand it out and we don't, we, we don't want to tell anyone anything, you know, so these are just, and they, they play with it and they couldn't figure out how to turn it on. The on switch was so beautifully sculpted into the case that it was, it just couldn't find it. There was no way to turn the thing on. So that was an example of a focus group input that was very valuable to us because we put a bump on the, you know, the designer was like, oh, you're ruining my beautiful design. You know, it's like, well, they can't turn it on. Like, you've got to have, uh, so, you know, those, we use focus groups for that uh, and, and things like that. You know, sit down and, and where, you know, do you like this center console better than this other one? You know, where the placement of the speedometer, you know, those kind of things. But whether, you know, what kind of car do you want now? We don't, didn't go there. Yeah, what's the future of energy generation? Uh, we're going to need a lot of it. Really into energy generation. Uh, so, so the the more power you have available, the easier problems become. 
You know, like if we want to, you know, desalinate lots of water, you can do that if you have enough energy that's, that's relatively inexpensive. So we want to generate a lot of power. We want to use it really wisely. We want to think about it really deeply. But, but ultimately, we don't want to be limited on, on generating electricity, particularly. Solar is obviously big, and, and wind is big. Uh, wind is super cheap. The batteries are going to allow us to make them baseload because they can store the energy, and that's happening right now. I mean, like the, the amount of, of what's called grid level storage that's going in, in is huge. I mean, it's, it's blowing through every estimate. You know, they've revised them every year, and the estimate gets bigger and bigger as to, to what. So the, the future is going to be, you know, wind is the cheapest, solar. Uh, and there might be, I, I have some friends that are super into uh, some next generation nuclear technology. Uh, I hope that works. I think that would be fine. It's, it's a completely different idea of how nuclear power works. And actually, one of the ideas consumes nuclear waste. It's actually, that, that's its fuel, is, is nuclear waste. It has some other problems, but it's an interesting idea because you end up consuming the, uh, in these piles of waste we have. And, you know, hydro and everything else. But I, I think ultimately getting enough electricity isn't going to be a problem because there's so many ways of generating it. And the neat thing about electricity, unlike, you know, whether it's oil or, or anything else or natural gas, is that once you've converted, once you have electricity, once it's on the wires, nothing that consumes electricity cares where those electrons came from. You don't have to retool your car because, you know, the mix of hydro and, and coal changed, you know. Uh, your car doesn't care or your, your hair dryer doesn't care. So, I mean, that's a really important thing. That it, the electric grid is incredibly flexible. So I, I think that that's, that's where we're going. Uh, the other thing is that the U.S. will at some point decide that having you know, stable, reliable power is a really good thing. And we'll put all of these ugly power lines underground. So the next time we have a windstorm, we don't lose power in the most advanced industrialized country in the world. I mean, like, it's craziness. Um, that's, that's my pet peeve with the power grid. Yeah, with the, the, uh, the burst of growth in the uh, electronic cars and everything else, how are we going to build enough facilities to recycle those batteries? And what is the battery life going to be in those cars? Yeah, what is the battery life going to be, and how do we recycle them? So, the, 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 in fact, I weirdly had a, had a pitch yesterday about, about exactly that. So, the battery life, there's a, a funny thing, is that the, further, the longer the range of the car, um, the sort of longer, the, 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 the less demanding it is on the battery if you will. So if you think about it, one of the ways is that batteries age is cycle life. It's how many full, you know, full cycles from full to, to dead you know, it, it has gone through. Um, and two half cycles are, are a little less uh, damaging to the cell than one full cycle. And of course, in your normal driving, you do lots of little cycles because you, know, you don't drive 300 miles every day or whatever. Uh, so if you think about it, a car with a limited range, let's say 50 miles, uh, going for uh, cars are consumed, considered for insurance reasons typically consumed at about a hundred thousand miles, and that's why if you ever have a car that has more than a hundred thousand miles on it, and you you get into kind of a minor accident, the insurance company wants to just total it, and you think, but this car is great, like it, you know, and they say, ah, you know, it's not really worth very much, uh, so that hundred thousand miles is kind of a, a marker in the car industry. If you have a car that only gets 50 miles of range, getting to 100,000 miles is, is like 2,000 cycles. It's a lot on a battery. If you have you know, a 300-mile range car, it's a lot less. It's, you know, what is that, 300 cycles or 400 cycles. And it's a lot gentler on the battery. So the longer the range that the car has, the longer lifetime the, the car has as well. It's, a, it's kind of weirdly counterintuitive. So hybrids suffer from battery fatigue because on any given day they drain their battery up and down, whereas electric cars, it's not nearly as, as bad. Uh, so the electric cars will last probably, like I have 115,000 miles on my, my current Model S, and you know the batteries have faded about 10%. Now, I will say that most cars after 115,000 miles 
don't work quite as well as when you bought them new. Uh, and my car actually has a lot more features than I had because they've done these constant software upgrades along the way. To recycle them, there are companies that do that. That's their you know, specialty is, is to recycle the, the batteries. It's quite likely, though, that for as, as these first wave of electric cars retire, what's really going to happen is those battery packs might get reused in other ways. They don't have quite the same capacity that they did when they were new, but they still have a lot of capacity in them. So one of the things that there are a bunch of companies doing, they repurpose those batteries for microgrid storage in communities that back up fire stations and hospitals. And there's a whole industry around taking, you know, Nissan Leaf batteries because they were first. So they've, Nissan's were out uh, in, in quantity before the Model S. So now they're, they're kind of coming into the market, the used ones. And they're getting repurposed for the next 10 years doing that. And then after that, they'll get recycled. So they actually have sort of a separate, you know, sort of second life that's useful. So going on with what you said about recycling batteries, why does Tesla recommend you only half charge? Uh, so Tesla doesn't recommend a half charge. So the way all lithium ion cells work is they up to about 85% uh, charge. So lithium ion batteries have a couple of funny things about them. They really, really hate being fully drained, completely dead. Like that is really, really, really bad for all lithium ion cells. So your cell phone will turn itself off long before, it'll, it, it'll still have 10% you know, power really. When it's dead, it won't come on again because it wants to always make sure that there's a little bit of charge in there because if it ever really, really goes to zero, the battery's kind of fried. And if you, um, if you have an old cell phone that you've left in the drawer for years and then you find it and you say, oh, I'm just gonna charge that puppy up and see if it still works, there's about a 50-50 chance that the battery will, will uh, expand and crush the cell phone as it, as it expands into a little football because it got fully discharged. And because it, 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 after years, it'll do that. Um, so, but on the top end, there's another uh, issue that the top like 10 or 15% of the charge does almost all the damage on a lithium ion cell in a cycle. So if you stay away from that, you have much, much longer um, uh, lifetime with the battery. So for a car, like I have, you know, my particular car, my, my old Tesla, has about a 260 mile range, fully charged. And, but I don't drive 260 miles a day. I just, I wake up in the morning, I have 260 mile range, I just don't drive that. So they recommend that you set it to the daily mode, which is about 85% of that, because that's what most people need. And you only put it in trip mode when you know you're going to go somewhere. Uh, and that's all, all lithium ion cells work that way. And, and the, the Nissan Leaf's got the same exact thing, and so does the Bolt and everybody. It's just that top, that very top range. You can still use it. It just means that over the lifetime of the car, it, it, the, the battery will fade a little bit faster. Another mundane question about VC. So how did you decide that you needed $50 million? Where'd you come up with it? How did we decide we needed 50 million? Yeah, oh, oh, we decided we needed less, I'm sure. And then, you know, along the way you go, oh shoot, you know, we need a lot more. Uh, so we had penciled out what things were gonna cost and what we thought we could get away with. And we, you know, undershot it. I mean, we, some things came in a little bit, uh, some, some things we were pretty good on and other things we just were wrong on. Uh, and then we made some changes along the way. Uh, we decided to change the design of the car uh, to make the car better. We wanted to, it, there was a, this big discussion at the board level about whether we made some changes to the Roadster which would make the car more delightful, really. And was that better to, to spend the extra $10 million basically by the time you put in all of the timing and everything else? Was that better than launching a car that wasn't as compelling uh, and, and I think the board made the right, I think we, you know, we went with the, we'll raise more money and, and make it better, make it a more delightful car. Uh, you know, you can't run the experiment either way, you know, you don't know, well, would it have been better if we hadn't raised the money and, and released the car earlier? Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, you always need more money than you think. And even then you need more money than that, uh, so. I, uh, I like to, I do think so sometimes use an analogy when I'm speaking about uh, different 
aspects of, of thinking about how technology advances. I think one of your favorite laws is uh, Moore's Law. One thing. Rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh, Moore's Law kind of dictates how fast technology changes, and it's actually pretty interesting. If, if, uh, if, you, if you really think back about how things have changed over the years and how quickly technology advances, uh, you probably, I'm sure you would agree. Um, one of the analogies I like to use is the subject of superconductivity. Now, before I start this, what has four legs and kills a party? Two engineers. Okay, so, because <laughs> we start talking like this and it just, you know, people start falling asleep. So, sorry about getting technical, but anyways. I'm not sure if everybody understands what superconductivity is here, but um, uh, what, it, uh, what we're talking about basically is electricity flows through wires. Those wires have resistance to that electricity flow. It results in inefficiency. And we deal with that all day long. And uh, superconductivity, though, is a state of those wires, say, that allows the electricity to flow with no resistance. So, that being said, what if tomorrow somebody announced we figure out how to do superconductivity at 100 degrees Fahrenheit? How would that change? What would that change? In, and are there people that you're aware of who are actually working on this technology? And how would it impact the, the thought processes of how things are going to advance? Yeah, so if, if room temperature super uh, uh, superconductivity actually works. Uh, so there's two things that would affect. One is that, it, well, it depends on how it works, right? If, if you're able to make transistors that do that and not have loss, then you could have, you know, wickedly fast computers because one of the things that, that prevents the computers from going as fast as they could is heat. And, you, if, and heat is the the resistance, right? So if you actually had superconducting transistors, you wouldn't have any loss and you could have really fast computers. So that would be good. Uh, in terms of, of cars and stuff, cars are, you know, electricity, we're really good at transmitting electricity around. The grid is 90 some percent efficient uh, most of the time. Uh, and, uh, and cars, you know, are uh, in the, uh, or electric cars are in the 90s as, as well. So you wouldn't get an enormous range improvement, for example, with a super, superconducting uh, motor, but you could do something very cool in that what limits sometimes the horsepower and the, the, the performance of the motor is actually the heat. It's, they're incredibly efficient, so they don't generate very much heat, which is why you don't have radiators and hoses and everything like that in an electric car, because almost all the energy is being converted into forward motion, not uh, heating your, your uh, radiator up like a, in a conventional car. But there is a little bit of waste, and that waste gets inside the engine. So if you had superconducting you know, uh, mo uh, motors, uh, you could just crank the horsepower into the, I mean, you, it, it would be a really fun ride. Yeah. It was. <laughs> Questions, any questions? Uh, where do you see the future of vehicle repair in terms of electric vehicles? The future of vehicle repair for EVs, super good question. So, uh, you know, everything breaks, right? And there's a ton of stuff that breaks like a normal car. But the drivetrain, the, the motor and the electronics and the battery are not going to be easily serviced and there isn't, they're only, so in a, in a typical, you know, like four cylinder high performance engine, there's about 400 moving things, really belts and fans and, and spinning things and stuff. Uh, in an electric car, that same drivetrain really only has the rotor, which is the spinning part of the electric motor and the two sealed bearings that that shaft is, is resting on. And that goes into a single reduction gear. So it's just a gear with a bigger gear. And that goes directly into the diff. That's the entire mechanical complexity of the drivetrain. So there's just not a lot that's going to fail there. So all the things that like, you think of normal, oil changes, and all, there's no oil, there's no... There's no antifreeze, you know, none of that stuff. There's no pumps. That, I mean, you know, all of those things don't exist in an electric car. So the maintenance is going to be less. 
Uh, and then when you repair them, you have a little bit of an excitement because you have uh, potentially lethal voltages in a car. And, and you, don't have a, you don't get a second chance. You know, like it's, it's over. Uh, but you know, when they used to work on cars, when gas, you know, gasoline is super dangerous too. And we learned how to deal with that. So you don't have gas, you don't have repair shops blowing up anymore because we, we understood how to deal with gasoline vapors and, 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 and all the stuff in a gasoline powered car. And electric cars, you just have to, it, nothing like that happens, but except that the batteries are potentially, you know, killers. If you, it, and there's all kinds of safety locks and everything else, but if you're repairing it, you can get around some of those things, I suspect. Do you, do you see the system as a closed loop system between the OB and the customers, or do you see the right to repair curve? Oh, I think the right to repair is going to have to, it, 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 you, you, you have the right to repair. I, I think actually it's probably in law you have the right to repair. Um, I think that for most people, they're just not going to want to do that because you really want to be trained. And, you know, modern cars are kind of like that. You know, a modern car, you got to have all of these, you know, computers and stuff that the, the OEMs, you know, force the franchisees to buy and, you know, in order to talk to their computers and make the car do stuff. So, uh, you know, electric cars, they don't have nearly as much stuff to do, but, but there are some special things you got to just be very aware of. I think you'd want to be trained <laughs> so you didn't get hurt. So early on, you said that one of the things that was uh, interesting about how you got started was you got bored, you didn't want, you, know, you wanted to run. Right? So if you're in a company that's multi-generational and needs to evolve, do you have any advice for how to make that happen? Well, how how to to make a a, a family-owned business sort of multi-generational business. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure it would be any different in a sense that you want to always be looking for new opportunities anyway. Um, yeah, I, I've never really thought of I don't know exactly. I, I've never worked for a company that's, that's been around for a long time and that, uh, you know, like 100 years kind of thing. It has a lot of history. Uh, but, you know, the school district that I, you know, was a part of, we're almost the oldest school district in California. Uh, this is our 166th year of instruction um, at public school. And, you know, we constantly have initiatives to reinvent what we're teaching and how we're teaching. And, and I think that companies need to do that all the time, too, regardless of whether you're a new company or a, an old company. Yeah, the innovate or die uh, thought, um, which I think as long as you're innovating, you know, it's going to require some creative, maybe exciting thinking and whether you're a old company or a new company, I, I, I think that you always have to go through that process or you'd be, you'd be proven to go into the future that process, so that might be one of the ways. Well, have like that part of your atmosphere as part of the culture. Yeah, it's almost like you want to have your own inbuilt venture capitalist engine running around trying to recreate the find the next big thing that you Yeah. You have to always be thinking about what the future is going to be like. The valley was just uh, determined to have the worst air quality in the country. How, what's a challenge to getting long haul trucks electric? And how can we ramp that up? Yeah, so the challenge with long haul trucking is just that it's a lot of energy you have to have on board. Now, you know, Tesla's making a long haul truck. Uh, it, it's a, it's you know a lot of batteries is is the is the issue, and I, is that the is that is it the the long haul trucking is one of the prime drivers for air quality in the valley is that yeah, um, better batteries I mean cheaper better batteries you know the the batteries get better at about seven percent a year so it's like a super slow Moore's law it doubling about every ten years though so you know one more doubling. And, you know, everything will be electric because the economics will be so compelling that no one will be able to afford, I mean, no one would do that. No one would stay in, in diesel or whatever. So even for long haul trucking, I suspect it would flip. It'll be the last, I think, just because of the number of, of the, the amount of batteries that you need uh, to, to make it work. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but on the other hand, there's a ton of, of work going on because batteries now are a thing. Uh, and the market for them is so very, very large. There's a lot of research into to accelerating that 
that uh, rate. The pros and cons of a hybrid car. So the, you know, there's two kinds of hybrids. There's a, the 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 the, the non-plug-in ones and the and the plug-in ones. The non-plug-in ones, the only way you get energy into that car is you pour it in through the gas tank. So they're just gasoline-powered cars. The only thing that they do is that when you slow down on a in a hybrid car, that works like an electric car in that you you end up doing that by generation and getting getting it power and storing that so that when you go to accelerate when you come to the stop and then you go to accelerate you you use that energy to to, to make you, your car go um, so you get a little bit better gas mileage in the cities it doesn't affect anything on on the freeway because you don't do that on the freeway well in the bay area you do that a lot on the freeway but i mean it, theoretically you're not doing it on the freeway um, so uh, and then the plug-in hybrids are a different beast in that, that they have uh, a much bigger battery and you plug them in at night or wherever you're parked or whatever and they charge up and then you can drive around for a while purely electric. And the idea is that then you don't have to worry about range because when you're, when you're out of, you know, when you run out of electricity then, then the engine can kick in and charge the battery basically and keep you going. The problem, I mean, and, and, you know, we, we've played with all these. Um, the only downside of that is you end up having two complete drivetrains. You have your whole electric drivetrain and you've got all your internal combustion and stuff. In. And if you took all the internal combustion engine stuff and got rid of that and simply put in more batteries, then you'd have a 250 mile range EV. And at that point you think, well, how much do I really drive in a day? Probably less than 250 miles. And if I just go pure EV, then I never have to stop at a gas station. Um, so I, the, the hybrids are interesting sometimes, but you know, I think long term, they're a transition. Long term, they go away because you end up dragging along a lot of metal and stuff that you hopefully don't use, except on a long trip, in which case you should just put more batteries in. That's, that's my take on them. So let's take uh, one more question. Um, okay, here. Um, you've mentioned your work with education. Is that still a primary passion for you? And if so, what challenge are you working on in that space? Yeah, so it's not a primary passion anymore, my education work, uh, because I'm off the school board. <laughs> and I am, you know, after nine years, I was so happy. In fact, we have a, uh, our superintendent just uh, uh, got poached by another district, and I'm like, oh, I'm so glad that, that I, the announcement came out today, and it's not me who's dealing with that. I love it. Uh, but uh, no, it, it, education's been great. I still am on uh, a private school board. I'm also on the board of a, a uh, a, a nonprofit called Innovate Public Schools that looks to do sort of innovative things largely around low income uh, and, and uh, minority populations in the Bay Area and Los Angeles. So I'm still involved, but uh, I'm, I am backing away a little bit because I'm getting more back into the technology side, which I, I you know, I'm better at, frankly. Yeah, I mean, education is super important because without that, nothing works. So you've got to fix the education system. I mean, like, that's, that's absolutely key. That that's creates all the opportunity, creates all the wealth, it creates everything. So you've got to get that working. And so it was really interesting to be part of that and to, to do my piece of that, that puzzle, and I'm still involved in that. Um, but now I'm, I'm a little bit more on the, you know, sort of Silicon Valley, um, you know, company investment, you know, mentoring thing, which is, uh, I'm a little bit better at, so. Anyway. Yeah, one quick question. Uh, oh, uh, question. Oh, go ahead. I, I think uh, the doctor had a good question right here. And that'll be the last one. Sorry, guys. Well, from your experience, do you find innovation comes from the same individual many times or from innovating teams? Yeah, does, it, does innovation come from the same individual or from teams? Everything is a team sport now. It's, it's, it's too, the problems are too big. I mean, everything is too... You know, and you can't, in fact, the more diverse the team is, it tends to be much more innovative, which you kind of intuitively would know because they're going to bring different perspectives and different educational backgrounds. Like if everyone is, you know, some white guy from Stanford, those tend to not be nearly as innovative teams um, as a, a more diverse, even just different universities involved, let alone race and gender and everything else. Uh, so you need a team, I think. Uh, and there's a... There's a great uh, leadership thing that my wife did where uh, they, they had this simulation where they, they crash on this, you know, 
this desert island or whatever, and they have to get off. And they're all broken into teams, and, and they do, and this is big groups, and they, they work on these teams, and they, they figure out how they're going to get off the island, and then everyone submits them, uh, and, and they're run across the uh, Navy SEALs are the ones who, who designed all these scenarios. So they have a rubric to, to grade them. Uh, and then they, after lunch, you know, they announce the winners of, of, of the teams that would have survived, that did, that did the best. Uh, and then, and everyone kind of jokes and laughs and, you know, applauds and stuff, the various teams. And then they show the uh, sort of distribution of, of diversity on the various teams. And the more diverse teams are the ones that survived, and the ones that, that are all neurosurgeons, you know, they all died. Uh, it's, it's really clear, yeah. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, appreciate your time. Really, uh, really wonderful that you uh, agreed to come. I, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, we have a little token of our esteem for you, something we actually designed. We made it here in our shop. Uh, not the cap. Uh, this is the, the this very high tech. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And then also our uh, flat bill snapback cap. Uh, wear it like you stole it. Uh, <laughs> It's, <laughs> we, uh, we love getting this to people who are special to us. So uh, thank you once again for coming. I really appreciate it. Great, thank you.